Hey, runners, welcome to the 2022 United Airlines NYC Half kickoff show. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a great show to get you ready for your training for the United Airlines NYC Half taking place March 20th. Uh, first, I want to introduce all of the great panelists on today's chat. Uh, first off, we have Coach Roberto, New York Roadrunners coach. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, good day, Steve. Hey, runners, happy to be here. And also we have from our partners at New Balance, Alex uh, Trackster. Thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. And then finally, Lindsay, you're part of our NYR runner service team, which I know you guys have been getting a lot of questions. So I'm so glad you can join us today. Yeah, happy to be here. So runners, we're going to talk a lot about training, a lot about what you should be wearing out there during your training and also maybe some final questions you have um, about the race itself leading up to the race March 20th. I wanna start off, Roberto, with um, training uh, specifically. And runners, if you have any questions for any of the panelists today, please put those in the chat. If it could be specific to your what you wear, questions about the race, put those in the chats. We're gonna get those throughout the uh, chat here. Roberto, I wanna to talk to you about training because a lot of runners are either have begun training or started the training soon. Um, where should they be in their training journey at this point, about eight weeks out from the race? Yeah, thank you, Steve. It's a good question. Um, obviously, running meets you where you are, and eight weeks out, about two months, people are coming in from different areas. So to answer this question, obviously, send us your questions uh, more specifically. So if you're two, two months out or eight weeks, um, if you're coming off of a long layoff or an injury, you might be in a different uh, starting point than somebody who's been training and maybe even coming off of a of an autumn marathon or fall marathon. So, but basically, eight weeks out, more or less, regardless of where you are, whether you started about twelve weeks, ago, which is kind of the the norm, or you're starting more, you're starting kind of from now, which I'm somewhat guilty of. Um, you want to just be, so you're still kind of in the base building, strength training, uh, strength running. Uh, portion of your training, meaning you're still doing some sp race specific workouts, um, or you will be doing them if you're starting from eight weeks out, um, and you probably have done a long run, or you will be doing your long run. Of course, if you're coming from um, eight weeks out and you started 12 weeks ago, then you've probably done a handful of long runs, but you still haven't hit your peak mileage yet, uh, your longest long run yet, and also you, you're starting to do some maybe race specific uh, workouts. So for those who are, who are a little bit newer, race specific means uh, workouts that are tailored more to the race distance. So obviously we're talking about a half marathon, so those are going to be a bit longer workouts. So you're probably doing some tempo runs, um, fart legs, and, and things like that. So about eight weeks out, you should be kind of um, hitting the sweet spot of your training, not peak mileage yet uh, and you still have you know maybe even six weeks of training left before you do your your begin your taper i love that roberto a lot of runners maybe haven't started training yet they're looking for a training plan talk about you know what to do maybe if you haven't started training yet how do you get started in training for the united airlines nyc half well, if you haven't started training yet, uh, which, like I said, I'm guilty. I just started earlier this week due to a, a little bit of layoff and injury. I, I would say don't panic. Just make sure you set realistic uh, expectations. You know, it's, there's essentially two kinds of people heading into a race, people who are chasing uh, performance, uh, time goals, you know, things like that. Maybe they've run the distance before or that specific race, so they know what they could do and what they've done in the past. And then there's the people who are also uh, just as important who are just running it for the experience. Just like I've never run a half marathon. I want to. Uh, complete the distance so you know those two sorts of people are going to approach their training differently but regardless um, if you have access to a coach uh, free training services obviously here at new york runners we have a host of coaching opportunity um, coaches and training opportunity be it via group training via uh, virtually via coaching lab um, and obviously depending where you are if you need a local coach but i would say try to get with a training group or contact the coach and you know set out your goals and then work backwards from that goal so if my goal is to run a half marathon in two hours have I run before? Have I completed this before? What I would done, you know, you kind of use that as a frame of reference. Again, if you have never run before, then maybe just set um, a less ambitious goal and then work towards that. And usually, regardless of whether you run a half marathon before or not, at some point during the training and the buildup, you start to see your fitness progress and you can start to make adjustments to your goal, whether it's make it a little bit more ambitious or, or less ambitious. But I would say definitely don't panic. And as I mentioned at the start of this, running meets you where you are. So just set a nice baseline goal and go from there. I, I like that, Roberto, a lot. And you mentioned training plans a lot, but what makes a good training plan? What should a new runner maybe look for in a training plan? Are there are there things that make a plan better than another plan? Um, what should I look for in that plan before starting training? 
Yeah, I would say a good training plan is one that is balanced. So what does balance mean? It's kind of, you know, a generic word, but balance meaning like it's not too speed oriented or it's not too endurance oriented. So, um, and it doesn't just, you know, it's balanced. So like what balance means. So it's, it has a combination of some short speed work, get the legs turning over, makes you more efficient, um, but it also has some uh, elements of endurance training because a half marathon is 13.1 miles. So you need to have a good aerobic um, capacity and base to get up there. Uh, so it has some combination of long runs and shorter long runs uh, as well. That way you're maybe alternating one week high, one week low. Um, and then again, just the sort of workouts you're doing, you want to run some hills, you know, it's, it's going to be course specific or race specific. That's also the, the hallmarks of a good training plan because if I'm training for a 10K on the track, I could do some of the similar training for a half marathon. Obviously it translates a little bit, but if I'm going to run uh, United Airlines NYC half, I study the course, I know where the hills are, so I might try to train that way versus if I'm running uh, uh, Brooklyn or you know one of these other local or other speedier half marathons. So make sure that uh, your training plan is well balanced in terms of what uh, it's, how it's tailored towards the race you're going to run, but also the distance itself. I love that. Uh, Alex, before I come to you, I want to say runners, thank you so much for watching. Please let us know your training questions. If you have anything related to the NYC half, please put those in the chats. And I see some of you guys, I see you out there putting where you're watching from. Let us know where you're watching from, whether it's, you know, in the Tri-State area, in the national U.S. area, or even if you're watching overseas, let us know where you're watching from as well as training questions. Um, Alex, now everyone loves, loves talking about running shoes. And I feel like we always like ch chats about running shoes because people, runners, we can talk about them a, a lot as well. Um, what is the best way for runners to find a good pair of running shoes if maybe they never bought a, a pair of shoes before? And Steve, that's a great question. It's a question that a lot of people ask me, you know, just even out and about the best place to go get a, the best pair of running shoes for you is to go to your local run specialty shop, um, whether it's a Fleet Feet, a, a Roadrunner, whether it's a you know local store like Big Peach uh, down here in Georgia, you want to go to the local place where they have experts that are trained to talk to you, get to know you, fit you, measure you, and try and figure out the best fit shoe for you. Every runner is different. We all know this. And we make a variety of different shoes for different types of people. Um, whether you want more cushion, less cushion, a tighter fit, a looser fit, you know, you're going to be running further in your training. You're going to be running a little bit shorter in your training. You want to make sure you find the right shoe that's fit for you. So the people that are trained at run specialty stores are probably the best in the business. They have all kinds of technology where they can take 3D images of your foot. They measure you with the Brannock sometimes too, and get like a more, you know, minute um, measurement of everything but they're gonna be able to know everything in and out about the shoes that they're gonna be showing you so that they can find the best fit for you. And at the very end of the day, it's finding the right fit for you personally, and they're gonna be the ones to be able to find that for you. There, there's a good thing about finding the right pair of shoes. It just feels like a pair of gloves, you know, it just fits so right and you know this is the right pair of shoes. But Alex, are there any maybe red flags people should watch out for with, with shoe buying? Or maybe it's a fit feel, maybe it's a gut instinct. What do you kind of talk to people about you know what to not look for in a shoe maybe yeah and when i was a fit specialist years ago at fleet feet the a lot of people would come in and say you know oh a shoe should fit tight right like a running shoe should fit very tight on your foot no that is a common misconception you want the shoe to be comfortably snug if the shoe feels way too tight across the forefoot way too tight in the heel maybe the toe is touching the edge of the shoe you don't want that at all it's not a ballet slipper you're going to be running a lot of mileage in here and if it's too tight, you're gonna lose a couple of toenails and nobody wants to see that. Um, so red flags include tightness around the forefoot, shoe is too short, maybe it's a little too tight around the midfoot. If it rubs in any specific way that you notice as soon as you put your foot in that shoe, you're gonna see a hot spot, you're gonna see blisters, and that's gonna make that 13.1 not feel so great, nor the hundreds of miles that you're gonna do prior to that starting line, uh, stepping up to the starting line, uh, that's not going to be too great for you. So you want it to be comfortable, but you don't want it to be, you know, fitting like a ballet slipper. Can shoe, can runner shoes change over time? So if I bought a shoe five years ago as a running shoe and it, you know, we'll talk about neutral stability, but like if I was a new, can I, can my running shoe change of what I like over time? Or most people, you're always going to fit a neutral shoe. So you never got to get tested again, never going to run a shoe to get fitted again. You know, you should always get retested, you know, if you're going through a training cycle and you know that you're neutral, you know, go ahead, buy another neutral shoe, buy the same shoe. Even if the model slightly updates, you know, try it out first, 
You know, don't just go walking into the store and say, I just need an 880, just give me the 880. Make sure you try it on because maybe the style, the model changes. Maybe your foot has changed a little bit over the time. Um, maybe you want to change and switch into a 1080 that might have a little bit more room. Maybe you find that the tightness of one shoe doesn't translate well to now that you're a seasoned runner and you want a little bit more of a looser fitting knit top upper instead of an engineered mesh. So you want to make sure that you get remeasured and reanalyzed. For myself, even, I used to run in the 1080, which is our neutral platform. Recently, I've been running into the uh, the Bongo, which is a more of a light to moderate stability shoe, similar cushion, but I like the extra firmness underfoot because when I'm doing my long runs, I feel like I need a little bit of extra underneath. As I'm getting a little bit older, I'm running my miles a little bit slower. I just find that I need a little bit extra underfoot. So always go in and get remeasured. Talk to the experts. That's the most important thing I can say is talk to the experts and they're going to be able to steer you in the right direction. So Alex, one more question for you guys. Thank you for all the questions coming in here, Alex. One more for you. We talked about shouldn't a shoe should not fit like a ballet shoe. It shouldn't be the tight and restricting. What should it feel like? I put this new thing on my foot that I'm, you know, you may be an eight normally. And now they're telling me I'm eight and a half or nine. What should that shoe feel like as I walk out the store? First thing I say, comfortably snug. You know, you want it to fit all in the right areas, comfortable around the midfoot, very comfortable in the heel, not super tight, but comfortably snug. You want there to be about a thumbnail's worth of space between the front of your toe and the front of the shoe. That's pretty much perfect for me. Um, you know, when you've got a little bit of extra space, you got to realize when you start running, your foot's going to swell up a little bit, especially if you're in warmer climates like I am down here in Georgia. Um, you want to have a shoe that has just a little bit of extra space in the front because when you put it on, like I said, shouldn't fit like a ballet slipper, it should have a little bit of space. You want it to move a little bit, but it shouldn't be so, so loose that it feels, you know, sloppy, sloshy. Your foot has a lot of space to move around in. You want it to be comfortably snug so that there's just a little bit of extra space to grow. That's great advice. Runners, as I said, please put any questions you have in that chat. I see a few in there. I see you guys. Put those in there. We're going to get to you guys in a second. So I really want to talk to Lindsay here. Um, Lindsay, a lot of runners looking at the NYR safety precautions, what's going to happen in March. Obviously, we cannot predict the future and things in the last two years is always ever changing. Talk to us about, you know, safety precautions and what runners should know at this point in their training as it relates to the race. What are we, what safety precautions are NYR taking? Yeah, this is the big question. Um, like you said, things are changing daily. So it's a little bit hard to say right now exactly what's going to be happening and what the situation will be in March. But um, I'm sure everybody has seen proof of vaccination will be required. Um, so you will have to show that you are fully vaccinated um, upon picking up your bib. How you're going to show that proof of vaccination is a little bit um, up in the air still. We're not 100% sure if it's going to be um, in person, if it'll be beforehand. We're still fleshing all of that out. Um, but the fact that the proof of vaccination will be required is something that's definite. Um, we also do expect to uh, require masks at the start and the finish, um, just because those areas are very um very crowded. You can't really social distance. Um, while you're running, you know, you can spread out a little bit more. So we haven't lately been requiring masks while running. Um, so we don't expect that that will change. But again, kind of hard to say exactly what's going to be going on. Um, but we'll definitely make sure that we keep runners up to date. Um, and we'll post everything on our website. And, you know, obviously, we can't really say too far in advance exactly what's going to be happening, but just make sure that you're keeping an eye on the website and the email communications that are going out. Um, Cause we'll try to let everybody know as soon as things change, if they change. Thank you. That Lindsay, that's helpful. I know there's a lot of things that are unknown right now. We're all playing by that. Are there things that your team just doesn't have, you know, the unknowns right now as they're not close to the race. You mentioned obviously how vaccines will be checked at the start of the race. Any other knowns that you can think of right now that runners are asking about that were just not close enough for the race to know? Um, I mean, yeah, that's a big one, um, how we're gonna check. Um, and then also the mask question, we've been getting that a lot. Um, so again, that's up in the air. Also mm -hmm. up in the air is, you know, how um, hydration and nutrition will be handed out. Um, that's still kind of being confirmed, whether it'll be, you know, uh, I know at the marathon we had an opportunity for runners to bring their own bottles and fill those at aid stations. Not sure if that's going to be happening again here. 
Um, but yeah, like I said, we'll make sure we try to keep everybody as in the loop as possible. Um, and just know that if there's something that you feel like we're not communicating, it's most likely because we don't know yet. Um, so everything is still a little bit up in the air. Whereas normally by this time, everything's pretty much confirmed um, just because things are changing so rapidly um, as we've seen over the past two years. Yeah, Lindsay, you know, that, that's awesome to hear. I know we're working with so many different agencies with Roadrunners, working with city agencies, state agencies, Department of Health, um, many different governments. So I know a lot of things are, are in work. So thank you for the clarity on that. I want to get some great questions for all of the panelists here. We have some good questions. Um, let's jump over to Roberto first. We have a question from Jay, really good question. Um, I ran the, uh, Jay asks, I ran the Fred LeBeau half on Sunday, looking to increase my speed for the NYC half. How is the best way to train? Can you, uh, where can you practice on the course? A two-parter there. Yeah, certainly. Uh, Jay, congrats on running Fred LeBeau uh, this past weekend. Actually, our very own coach Steve was there with um, our colleague Ben, so shout out to them. They were pacing. Uh, but yeah, so speed is relative. So, you know, speed for a half marathon is different than speed for a 5K, obviously. But at the end of the day, speed, there's speed endurance. So what you want to do without knowing, obviously, what sort of workouts you've been doing is just focus on maybe shorter and faster repetitions. So I would say, you know, if we're going to go by, based on time, because not everybody has access to a track, I would say do a workout like, uh, you know, maybe build up to this, but like maybe 10 times two minutes, you know, and you're running two minutes relatively hard. And when I say hard, I mean faster than your goal half marathon pace. So um, let's say my goal half marathon pace, as I said earlier, is to, uh, is four hours. That's about a 909 per mile. So I'm running these two minute segments, maybe at 730 or 745 under eight minutes per mile. So as much faster than half marathon pace, but obviously I'm, I'm only holding that for um, two minutes versus, you know, 120 minutes, which is two hours. So, um, and you know, I would do a workout like that, but again, build up to it. by build up. I mean, maybe the first time you do it, start with, um, four times two minutes and maybe do two minutes on and then two minutes off. And those two minutes off could be two minutes, either slowly jogging, continuing to move or standing around. Ideally, I like to tell runners to have an active recovery. Um, you know, you could even do something similar to that, but make it one minute and then just make it a little bit quicker, but obviously under control. Uh, there's also obviously um, other workouts you could do like 400 repeats. That's 400 meters, one lap around the track. Or again, you could go based uh, time based or like, like I said, one minute, two minutes, even three minutes. Uh, I wouldn't go much more than, than maybe four minutes just because at that point it starts to change over energy system, but you could still go fast enough recover uh and then again doing that is going to work on your turnover your speed endurance and that will make your goal half marathon pace of hypothetically um nine minutes and nine seconds per mile seem a lot slower because your your body's used to running faster than that and of course you're also sandwiching that with like longer runs long runs but also longer workouts where you're getting closer to your goal marathon uh, half marathon pace hopefully that helps then Roberto, the last question from Jay, where, uh, the course, can we run the whole course in training or course parts we can't run in training? Can I talk about that briefly? Yeah, certainly. Uh, again, shout out to group training uh, and their weekend long runs. They've been covering portions of the course each week. So, you know, um, for future uh, rest, um, signups, you know, if you're local, I would definitely recommend signing up for NYR's group training because they cover a lot of the courses for our marquee events. But um, if you're not part of that, no worries. Uh, a lot of people have run portions of uh, Prospect Park because that's where the course starts. So you get, you know, Battle Pass Hill and things like that. You could get um, acclimatized to it. Uh, again, staying safe, you could really run most of the course staying on the on the shoulder um, slash city, city uh, sidewalks. So, you know, running down Flatbush, running over the bridges. Obviously, you can't run on the FDR the way the, the course is closed race day, but you can run again on the, you know, on the, on the, on the bike path there next to the East River. So that's another option. And then, you know, um, I know in years past, I've run up 7th Avenue through Times Square, which is obviously a lot, of, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of people, a lot of traffic, a lot of tourists, less so these days, but, you know, doing going early in the morning. And then obviously you could always run in Central Park. So you could break up the course and, and tackle sec different sections of it um, different uh, on different weeks as part of your long run. And again, that's what we're doing at NYR Group Training. So, but yeah, familiarizing yourself with the course, whether you're actually set foot in it or not, is a great way to give yourself um, a leg up on the competition for race day. That's awesome. Thank you. Alex, I want to jump to you. Really good question from Cassandra. She asks, should we have different pair of shoes for shorter and longer runs? 
So I certainly do. I have the uh, the Vongo for my everyday runs. I do, I do wear it for long runs, but I have been able to get my hands on a pair of Fresh Foam Moors um, for some of my like extra long runs. If I'm feeling a little beat up, there's a lot more cushion underneath. But if you are doing some shorter mileage and you're wearing a slightly firmer shoe like the 880, or you're wearing a, a shoe of the same category in a different model or a different style from a different company, you know, you want to have a shoe for days when you're going to go extra long. So, you know, it's good to have something in the rotation too, because your shoes will last just a little bit longer. So you want to have like a high cushion shoe for your longer runs, something that's going to take a little bit more care of your feet um, for when you're really pounding out the miles. Maybe you're going to be doing your workouts. You know, coach is going to be sending you some, some speed workouts. You want to have something that's going to be a little bit lighter on your feet, something that might fit a little more snug. I would say like the, uh, like the Rebel has a different feel than the 1080 or the Vongo because it's going to have a, um, a tighter, like closer, closer to the foot feel and the fuel cell foam on that compared to fresh foam is going to be a little more bouncy, a little more rebounding. Um, so you're going to be able to go a little faster. You're going to be able to get your tempo up. So it always feels good to swap into a different shoe if you're going to be changing your, your paces. So like I said, if you're going to be running a little slower, you're going to be doing your long run, your regular maintenance run, it's good to have a good high cushion shoe. But if you're going to be doing a faster workout, it's nice to have a bit of a lighter shoe. So, you know, Rebel or even an 880 um, in our fresh foam category, or even an 860, it's going to have a little more firmness underneath, a little more snap. So it's not going to be as soft as some of our higher fresh foam category shoes. So yeah, absolutely. Pick up, uh, you know, two, three, five pairs of shoes if you want, as long as it's all in the same kind of category, either neutral or stability, and you've been fit and they said it's okay, wear as many shoes as you like. Not at the same time, though. Different days. Not at the same time. No, no, not two, two not different shoes on both feet. You don't want to do that. Lindsay, I want to jump to you for a second. We have a good question from Teresa. She says, hi, Lindsay. Will we be picking our bibs up at the Expo or at the NYR Run Center? I um, wonder if you know that information yet. Um, and if not, we can obviously let them know soon to come. Yeah, so um, we will be having an Expo type thing uh, for this race. We call it the Experience. Um, the location of that is still to be confirmed. Um, we do expect it to be in Manhattan, like it has been in years past, um, but most likely not at the runner. Um, we do try to have, you know, vendors in there, have our coaching staff there, um, kind of make it a little bit more exciting than a regular weekly race. Um, but definitely stay tuned for the um, location. And it will most likely be the three days leading up to the race. Um, again, times not super confirmed yet um but just keep that in mind especially if you're traveling um from outside of new york we don't offer bid pickup on race day so you will want to make sure that you are um in new york the day before the race so that you can get your bib and also just check out everything else that there is uh at the experience because it's usually a lot of fun love it roberta let's jump over to you for a second we have a question from jeffrey unfortunately he has an injury um, he says, what is your advice for a runner who, who experienced a knee and ankle injury and is planning to return to running, assuming running the United Airlines NYC half in March? Yeah, certainly. Uh, Jeffrey, sorry to hear about that. Obviously, not knowing the extent of your injury, how long ago it was, um, or if you're at 100% now or if you're um, kind of still dealing with it, I'll, I'll do my best to answer your question. So if, um, if there's something more specific that you want to point to, feel free to, to have a follow up. But I, I would say to start out slow, um, be kind to yourself. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm one of those people who are eight weeks out or just essentially starting to train because I came into um, the TCS UC marathon with a little bit of a niggle and I came out of it with more of one. So I'm kind of in the same boat you're in where I actually feel like I'm at 100 percent. But I uh, and the advice I'm going to give you is essentially what I'm following where I'm starting really slow. So I'm thinking about the race, knowing when it is, the date and everything, but I'm not even setting any goal other than to accomplish it. And knowing that bit by bit as my fitness progresses, as the quote unquote injury feels less and less or it's 100% healed, then I could start to make adjustments. So what I would say for you is just um, do a whole total body assessment. Maybe the shoes you're wearing aren't the best to be wearing and they're not as supportive, or maybe you need more supportive shoes because you have a little bit of uh, weak ankles now or even a uh, muscle imbalance. So, you know, I would say first and foremost, definitely go, um, if you have a physiotherapist and they've been advising you, check it with them. That way they could tell you like, yeah, you're at 80% 
recovery or you're at hundred percent. And then after the end, you may return to running, assuming you are. And then aside from that, definitely visit a specialty running store because again, maybe the shoes you're using this past autumn aren't as supportive as what you might need now coming off of a, a ankle and knee injury. So those two are, tend to be pretty um, connected. You know, if you roll your ankle, your knee might be there to stabilize it and you might've tweaked that or maybe it's a weak knee um, that's actually kind of being compensated by the ankle. So there's a lot of things that I need to figure out, but regardless of where you are, I would definitely say start out more conservatively. And then if you feel any sort of pain, stop. Because one of the quotes that I always beat to death is that it's better to be 10 miles, um, on, uh, it's better to be 10 miles under train than one mile over train. And it's always that one mile too much. And I learned that again from experience where if you had just taken that day off or listened to your body, you actually would not be injured this time around. So as you come back, it's the same sort of thing where you want to listen to your body and start as conservatively as possible and build from there. Great. Um, Alex, I want to jump to you because we have three questions about socks. So it is a hot topic today on the chat It's running socks. Um, I'll just, Dana's asking best running socks. Erica's asking, should socks be thin or thick? And then Denise has blisters, which uh, make assumption from socks, could it could be shoes too. Um, and how do you deal with blisters? So maybe talk about the importance of socks, what kind of socks and how to avoid blisters. Yeah. So socks are, I mean, they're probably just as important as a, the perfect fitting pair of running shoes. Um, you want to have socks and personally, I love Belega. I'm not a spokesperson for them, but I love Belega. If I'm going to go for a long run or if I'm going to do a race, I always go for my Belega socks. I love the cushioning. I love the of the higher thread count. Essentially, you want the sock to mimic, well, you want the sock and the foot to fill 100% of the volume of the shoe. So if you have a high volume foot and you're wearing a shoe that has a somewhat low volume, like a, a Rebel, you obviously can't put a hidden comfort Belega sock in that because the volume percentage is going to be way too high. You're going to be way over 100%. So you want to go with a thinner sock with a higher volume foot in that shoe because it's going to feel comfortably snug, like what we were saying before. If you're wearing a regular shoe, like a regular training run, and you're going to be wearing like the Bongo, you're going to be wearing the 1080, or the 880, the 860, you can go ahead and you can put a, um, a higher volume sock as long as it is non-cotton. Um, on that foot in that shoe and it's going to fit very comfortably so if your foot and your sock ratio are just way too high you know you're putting too much volume in that shoe that might cause blisters you know if your shoe is a little too tight and you're putting a higher volume sock on you know that's going to cause blisters um you want to make sure that you're not wearing cotton too especially in the winter time you know like i said before your feet are going to swell a little bit. Your feet are going to get hot. There's a lot of friction going on underneath inside that shoe. So you want to make sure that you're not wearing a cotton sock because one, cotton is going to absorb moisture. Two, it's not going to wick away moisture. And three, it's going to have a very low thread count. So there's going to be a lot of space between those stitches. A more manufactured sock like Belega, Swiftwick, Features are going to have a higher thread count, very much like those Egyptian cotton sheets. The higher the thread count, the softer the sheet. So it's going to have a very nice soft feeling underneath the foot. It's going to wick away moisture because it's going to be polyester. And it's going to keep your foot from having a lot of friction, a lot of rubbing. So stay away from cotton. You know, they always say cotton is rotten. Um, just don't wear them. And try and wear something that's going to fill the volume of the shoe that is going to be, you know, filling 100%, not over that. So, um yeah, I would say socks, something manufactured, something polyester, something synthetic, um, stay away from cotton and make sure that the volume of the sock matches the volume of your foot so that it fills the volume of the shoe comfortably. I love that. Never thought about volume and socks. I love that. I learned something new today. Um, yeah. I want to go to Lindsay for Lindsay for the last one here and then I'm going to get back into our, our, our runner show. Uh, Lindsay, Alyssa is asking... When will the map and details of the course be released? What can we expect in this year's course? Uphills, downhills, weather? I know a lot of it, once again, as we said, it's, it's still undecided yet, but what can you share with us about the course? Yeah, so um, the map is still being finalized. Um, it's a lot of work uh, with the city just to make sure that we can have the right roads closed and make sure that everything's all set with that. We just don't wanna be 
you know, telling runners that it's going to be one thing and then have that changed. Um, but we do know it will start in Brooklyn in Prospect Park um, and it will finish in Central Park. Um, so there is a bridge involved. Um, you got to get from Brooklyn to Manhattan. Um, and it's a little bit of everything, which makes it kind of a fun course. You know, you have the parks, but then you also have the city streets and the bridge, which makes it really exciting. Um, definitely, I would say we got some hills in there. Um, the parks are pretty hilly. Um, that's kind of deceptive. People assume that New York City does not have hills, but it's pretty hilly. Um, Weather-wise, it's generally pre pretty cold. Um, so you want to make sure that you're bringing those layers um, for the start, especially, you know, if you want to get there early, which we recommend, you know, you can get in your stretching and your bathroom breaks. Um, but again, you know, the weather has been just as insane as everything these past couple years. So who knows? It's kind of hard to say we might get a randomly warm day. Um, so I would definitely say, you know, as we get closer, keep an eye on that weather map so you can plan your race outfit. Um, but yeah, generally it's on the colder side still in March. Love that. Thank you so much for the information. Roberta, I want to go to you about motivation. So um, what are ways runners can stay motivated throughout their eight to 10 weeks of training? As we know, it's so exciting day one to get that training plan and get out the door on the first run. And maybe the last run is, is cool too, because you're right for the race. But there are some weeks there that are hard to get yourself out the door because, as Lindsay said, especially here in the East Coast, it's cold, it's snowy. So how do we motivate ourselves to keep up with our training? Great question. Uh, that's something that I struggle with year in, year out for the last 100 years that I've been running when it comes to winter, just because winter is not my, my season. So if you're like me, where you struggle to get out the door in winter, uh, one way to get motivated or even inspired is to, you know, if you have access to a, a training group or you, or you can even form one, that's the best way. Again, shout out group training. We have a lot of runners. I even got together this morning and I was like texting coach Ben, like, it's so cold. How's everyone doing? They're all great. So, you know, the, the, the idea is that there's safety in, in number um, as far as not like safety or, or danger, but like there's that accountability. So one way to get motivated is to, you know, pair up with somebody else who's training, even if it's not the exact same event, you meet up with each other a couple of times a week and you could kind of make sure that you get together on those days where it's going to be a long run and you could do part of it together or the weather's going to be a little bit tougher um, or more challenging. So that's one way. Another way is really just focus on your why, you know, everybody should have a why, whether that why is performance uh, or just to experience the distance or I'm running this for a loved one, a friend or family, because that oftentimes that why is really also what kind of helps push us out the door. And, and also even on race, it kind of helps us uh, dig a little bit deeper. So motivation wise, I would say just focus on, on your why and try to form a little bit of a community, whether it's joining an actual group that already exists out there in your local community or, you know, tapping a friend or even a loved one. I know that in years past, I've had friends who are maybe not quite runners or um, or into going that long, but they hop on the bike and they help you out for your long runs. They keep you company, they hand you drinks. Uh, again, that kind of helps you get motivated and inspired because you know you're out there not just for yourself. I love that. What about when it's uh, maybe super unsafe outside? How do we how do we get the workouts in? You know, it's snowy, it's a blizzard, it's super cold, it's icy. What is the best plan for runners to keep training during those days when you just can't even get outside because it's not safe? Certainly, I would say definitely um, have flexibility and get creative. Uh, as I believe Lindsay said earlier, like the weather has been, you know, a, a bit tough lately as far as cold. So I say just adjust your your goals accordingly. Um, you know, today is Thursday, for example, and I have a long one on Sunday. So I'm already looking at the forecast. I know there's a potential northeaster. So maybe I switch things around where I do my long run uh, on Friday or Saturday instead of doing it on Sunday. So that's one way, kind of having that flexibility within your training schedule. And then the other one is also, again, getting creative, either take the day off completely and you know run another day and, and kind of save that because it's all about your accumulated fitness it's not just that one day so you know be kind to yourself but also you could do things like cross train so you could do cross train either indoors at your home get creative uh, a lot of different opportunities and examples online that exists out there another way is you know obviously if you have access to uh, either a treadmill or a gym you can get on the elliptical uh, save your legs on pounding but still get that um, aerobic workout in or obviously get on the treadmill itself at a, at a gym or your home if you have one. Um, and then another thing that I used to use back in the day in, in Boulder, Colorado, I would use the parking structures, you know, for a, a mall or a movie theater or, you know, what have you, whatever might be around you, because those tend to either be 
plowed well or or absolutely covered. So again, we would go early in the morning when there were a lot there weren't a lot of shoppers or essentially any, um, or later in the evening when shops are closed. And again, it's empty because if you're running in there, you want to be mindful of other potential um, cars and pedestrians there. But yeah, being able to run laps in there or do a combination of running a little bit outdoors and then running into the parking structure and then running outdoors, sort of splitting your runs. Those are things that uh, we've done in the past. But again, assess your your area because we all live in different areas. Um, in Central Park, they would do a fantastic job of plowing the, the pathways and, and the drive. So that's another place where a lot of people really tend to go more when it's snowing than maybe going out to the streets. But, you know, it's get creative. Um, be adjust your schedule as necessary and or just um, head indoors cross train great great advice roberto uh i see we have a lot of questions guys put any training questions in the chat it could be about apparel shoes training your training plan or about race logistics put those in the chat so we're going to get those in a little bit alex i want to jump to you because as roberto said it is cold out there people are looking to what to wear out there during those cold workouts whether you're in a parking garage or whether you're on Central Park. So how do we stay warm in the cold months of winter time, especially thinking, you know, training for a March race? Yeah, so great question. And, uh, you know, I'm originally from Buffalo, so I am no stranger to running in cold and bitter and, uh, you know, just terrible snow. So uh, absolutely great question. What you wear depends on, you know, the climate that you're running in. For example, what I wear in Georgia will change dramatically from what my partner wears up in Michigan. So. The most important thing you can do is keep your core warm. If you can keep your core warm, the run won't be so bad. Once your core starts to get cold, that's when you start to, you know, lose the efforts and lose the benefits of the actual run itself. So your body heat will go up as you run, you will perspire. So the most important thing is you want to make sure that you have moisture wicking clothing. Um, for us with New Balance, the Heat Loft jacket, the Heat Loft crew, the Heat Loft pant, you know, very similar to what I'm wearing right here. I'll stand up a little bit. You can kind of see it's got kind of a knitted embroidered material. This is our heat loft jacket. It's a full zip, very comfortable, very warm on the inside. This is a really great piece for days when you're just out for a run and, uh, you know, you're only going to be out there for a little bit. It's very relaxed fitted, so it's very comfortable. It's not super tight to the body. If you're going to be out there for a little bit longer, our heat grid half zip or any of our heat grid materials are going to be awesome. The grid on the inside, captures and traps heat and it's a little bit tighter to the body so it's going to capture it's going to trap that heat it's going to keep your body a little bit warmer especially your core um, as you're out there in those colder wet colder temperatures you know getting your long runs in putting in the work building the building the house building up the bricks as you get towards race day um, our most important stuff or our, our, our best stuff i would say is our newest stuff it's our q speed intro and that's going to be textured knit material again all moisture wicking and this NB heat technology wicks moisture away from your body. So especially if you're doing those longer runs and you're starting to get a little sweat in, I know I run warm in the winter time too. Um, you want to make sure that again, you're keeping friction down and that moisture is going to be wicking away. If you're just going out in the winter time and you think doubling up on a, you know, a hoodie and a cotton t-shirt is going to help you. It's not because that's going to just absorb all that sweat, get very cold. And again, from the very start, it's going to cool down your core. So as long as you can keep your core warm, wearing the right materials, especially if it's from New Balance, um, my favorite is that heat grid half zip. I probably have every single color of them. They are absolutely wonderful. Um, what else is there? Gore-Tex shoes too. Those are important to have. Your feet and your hands, because they're your most furthest extremities, those are the second most important. So you want to make sure you have good gloves and Again, moisture wicking socks from what we said before, and you want to be wearing shoes that are properly fitted as well as if you have to run in the really bitter cold or if it's going to be blizzarding and you're just going to go out. A Gore-Tex shoe is also good. Most companies make a Gore-Tex shoe. We have the 880 and the Hiero, which is our trail shoe. Um, that thing is awesome for especially snowy conditions. We used to sell a lot of those in Buffalo through the winter time. People would just run in uh, trail shoes because they have the lugs. They're a little bit stronger underneath and the rubber is a little bit more grippy so um yeah i would say in terms of apparel anything that's going to keep your horror warm you want to make sure that it's moisture wicking comfortably fitted and uh we make some really great stuff with our mb heat technology it's unbridled i love it alex what is the coldest temperature you have ran in as a buffalo as a native of buffalo 
That's actually an easy question for me to answer. I did a long run with some teammates of mine when I was going to SUNY Brockport. Shout out Golden Eagles. Um, it was probably negative 10 running into the wind on a three-mile stretch of country road with wind blowing just right into your face. And the snow was probably knee deep. So we can't not have been going any faster than probably 10 minute mile pace, but that was probably the coldest I had ever been. And I had also forgot my hat that day. So that was, uh, that was awful. Yeah. <laughs> how do you, I mean, the hat aspect, you leave the house, you realize you forgot how to get to the run and you realize you don't have it. I woke up late and I was meeting my, my teammates at their house. They lived off campus. So I was like, Oh my God, it's, I'm like two minutes from when they're going to leave. So I put on all my stuff. I ran out the door, ran the half mile to their house. And I realized I forgot my hat. The adrenaline was still running. I thought they were going to leave without me because it was also long run day. So it was just a, it was just a bad next two hours. I want to spend another hour on this conversation about you forgetting a hat on a negative 10 degree day, but we'll go back to that after that show. <laughs> over. Cause you mentioned a lot of different fabrics. Um, I mean, we talked about cottons, we talked about wool, we we're talking about moisture wicking. I don't know. It's a lot of different fabrics and I'm not an apparel person. Can you explain what those different fabrics and how they react differently maybe for summer versus winter running, um, what runners should look for in a, for a February, March race compared to a July, August race? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, uh, you know, your July, August races, you're going to need something that's going to be a lot lighter. So uh, what I love from New Balance is our impact and our Q speed materials. Um, they are kind of tooled differently depending on, you know, the type of weather that you're going to be running in. The knit could be a little tighter in the wintertime. So it's going to, uh, it's going to keep the warmth in. Whereas in the summertime, our Q speed uh, short sleeve and long sleeves, they're going to be a little looser. They're going to have some more perforations on them. So that's going to be a little bit more uh, breathable, a little more moisture wicking uh, when it comes to like wicking away the moisture and also drying it. The dryability on that is a lot higher in the summertime. And especially down here in Georgia, it's very humid. I typically wear very minimal amount of clothes. It's going to be like a Q-speed tank, an impact tank, and a pair of like three-inch splits. When in the wintertime, it's going to be, you know, NB heat tight. It's going to be Q-speed intro and maybe a heat loft um, over that just to get started. So you want to kind of tailor it, and you also kind of know your body a little bit. I know that I run a little warmer. So for me, if it's not super windy, I don't need that extra layer. I can just get by with the heat grid half zip and a pair of heat tights. Um, but in the summertime, you know, I know, again, I'm going to run a little warm, so I can wear just the short shorts. I can wear just the t-shirt and be just fine. It really comes down to talking to the experts at the store. They're going to be teched by tech reps like me, and they're going to know everything, the in and outs of those clothes. So if you're looking for something for that summer, late spring weather, you know, know the climate that you're running in, know that your body is might run a little bit warm, or maybe you'll be a little bit colder. Um, I know for my wife, she's always cold when she runs. So even in the summertime, she will wear a long sleeve shirt. But in the um, in the wintertime, she will probably wear more clothes than I will ever put on in my entire life. So know your body, know the climate that you're running in, and go and feel the material. You know, feel what it's going to feel like. A cotton shirt might feel comfortable right at the very start, but at the end of those runs, you can probably take that thing and just wring it out like a uh, like a dish towel, and that's not great. Like you don't want to be able to do that. Um, so look at moisture wicking, look at breathability, and then look at, uh, the dryability of that. So the rate of drying for any of our key speed materials is going to be very quick. You know, it's not going to absorb that moisture. It's going to wick it away and it's going to dry it off very quickly. So that's also important too, because it's going to keep the friction down. So, yeah. That's great advice. I'm assuming your wife has not ran in negative 10 degrees without a hat. She was a uh, she was a sprinter, so they never spent a lot of time outside. She was always a, a hurdler, so they were always in the field house while I was out there freezing my butt off. <laughs> she picked the better sport. I want to looking off the negative ten degree weather conversation again, Lindsay. I want to come to you and guys. As I said, runners who are listening, put any questions you have in that chat. We're gonna get to those in a few more minutes because Lindsay, we have some important information <clears throat> for runners about coming up to race day that I want to know. And as we just talked about Lindsay before, a lot of unknowns, but there are some things that you can tell runners such as, um, you know, maybe the race as we know is in Brooklyn. So for a lot of Manhattanites or people aren't maybe from New York city, is there an easier way to get to the start of the race than maybe other ways? What do you recommend just getting to the start of the race? 
Yeah, we definitely recommend taking public transportation. Um, parking is always questionable. Um, so if you have to drive and you have to park, make sure you get there super early. Um, we recommend public transit or, you know, if you want to take a cab or Uber, um, if you're more comfortable with that, you know, um, that's also a good option. But public transit is very easy to get to Brooklyn. Um, if you come to the experience and you have specific questions about getting there from where you're staying, you know, we will be there on hand, happy to answer those. Um, also, definitely make use of the MTA website um, just to double check if you've planned out your um, strategy for getting to the race. Um, you just want to make sure that there's not any planned service changes um, during race weekend because they like to do that on the weekends. Um, but if you use the MTA website, um, even if there is construction or something going on on the line that you were planning on taking, um, that'll give you some other options for how to get there um, from specifically where you'll be starting. Um, same thing from the finish, lots of trains around Central Park. Um, so it's pretty easy to get back to wherever you're going from there. Um, but obviously all depends on where you're coming from. Um, but like I said, we will be there at the experience. Any specific questions that you have, more than happy to answer those. Um, also, once the official course map is posted, we do try to put um, the you know most useful trains on there as well, uh, just to give you some options for getting to and from the race. I love that, Lindsay. Thank you. I always tell runners going to the race, just follow the thousands of runners ahead of you because everyone's going mm -hmm. to the same place. So um, just look at people ahead of you and follow the lead of the, the runners. Um, Lindsay, I know the course, we're still looking at finalizing the lefts and rights of the course. Are there places that are really good to cheer at, places that we can't cheer at? Is there anything we could tell as people think like, oh, I'm going to cheer on my best friend at the race on the first half marathon? What can we let them know about cheering at this point? Yeah, so the start and finish um, around there, those are always fun places to be, um, especially because for this race, they're both within parks. Um, so it's kind of a fun place to cheer if you want to cheer at the start or the finish. Um, even if you want to do both, uh, you can go to the start and then take the subway from the start to the finish. Um, so that's always fun. The places that you can't spectate are on the bridge from Brooklyn to Manhattan. Um, that is only open to runners. Um, and then there's usually a part, um, I believe that this is staying the same this year, um, that goes along the FDR um, all the way on the east of uh, Manhattan. And most of that is also closed uh, to spectators. But um, further into Manhattan, uh, before the runners enter Central Park, um, you can also spectate along the road there. Um, again, we usually uh, put out some spectator information closer to the race, um, especially for people who want to uh, spectate in more than, than one location. So how to get from point A to point B to see your runner multiple times. That's really good information. Thank you so much for that. And I know as we get closer to the race, we'll have more information about where family and friends can and can't cheer, but I know people might start planning that now. Um, runners, thank you so much for joining. As I said, any questions, please put those in the comments section. We're going to get to those I, and I, you guys have been giving us tons of shout outs throughout this conversation. I want to give some of you guys some love back. So Jeffrey from Orlando, Florida, thank you so much for watching. We got Remy, thanks for the video. Edgar, as always, hello from East Harlem, United Runners. Thank you, Edgar, as always. We got Reese, hello from NY. Ben from hello from upstate Manhattan. We got Martise from Dominican Republic. Alexandra from Brooklyn. Denise from New Jersey. Denise, what part of Jersey? Because I'm in Jersey. Let's hang out soon. Uh, we got Ali from uh, West Africa. Might be the first West, West Africa I've seen in these chats. We got Alyssa, good morning, from Los Angeles, California. We got Joan from Ireland and uh, Hens from Finland. So, guys, thank you so much for watching our chat. And, guys, as I said, this chat is all about you, runners. So let's get to these questions. I'm going to Roberto for the first one here. Roberto, Amy has a question about supplements. And I know we're not doctors, but what can we help this Amy out with? She says, my stomach can be sensitive. My, my stomach can be a bit sensitive and I have no idea what kind of gels or bars or whatever to try. Is that needed for 13.1? I know I should, I know I shouldn't try anything new and race to you, but how do you go about testing which one works? Really good question. What do you think? Yeah, thank you for uh, sending that in, Amy. I, I would say, um, 
are they needed? Again, it's everybody's different. We all run different, pun intended, you know. So I, for example, might require a different nutrition or hydration uh, supplements uh, along the course if the weather is 80, 90 degrees because I'm sweating more, et cetera, versus, you know, typically the sort of weather we get for United Airlines and NYC have. So that's first and foremost. Uh, and then second of all, I would say, yeah, we do say nothing new on race, but this is a time to experiment on what works for you and what doesn't. So you could do it, you could save it for your long run. So that means you're kind of testing things out once a week, but you could also maybe try uh, something even midweek if you're going out for a medium long run or just a workout in general, because you're trying to, to find out right now what sits well in your stomach versus what's going to take you the, the, the duration. So in short, depending on how long you're going to be out there, you know, if you're going to be out there for a half marathon for an hour and a half, you might require less uh, hydration, nutritional supplements than somebody who's going to be out there for two hours or two and a half hours or three, et cetera. So I would say there is no right or wrong answer as far as like, is it needed? But yeah, the longer you're out there and depending on the weather conditions and the more uh, you're going to rely on hydration and nutrition just because simply you're out there working hard for a longer period of time. And then I would say, uh, personally, I, I definitely like Honey Stinger just because they use uh, natural natural and organic um, products and sweeteners for, for their, you know, their, their crisps, their, well, their waffles, their, their, their gels. So um, I would definitely try that. You can pick them up at most um, running specialty stores and, you know, try it out if it sits well with your stomach and you find that it gives you the proper amount of boost and energy for your run, then you found it. If not, then obviously move on to another one. But also, you know, check out the ingredients. Obviously, you know better uh, what sort of allergies you have, what sort of foods you have, what sort of flavors, caffeine, uncaffeinated, um, because most supplements, um, hydration, nutrition out there are going to have a, a combination of both and options. Love it. Um, great advice there, uh, Coach Roberto. So this next question, I kind of want to toss to Alex and also Lindsay. It's two-parter kind of. Um, Alex, we'll jump to you first. It's from Vincent. He says, depending on the weather, I may be wearing several layers of clothing at the start. Will there be charitable organizations that will collect the discarded clothing? So Alex, how do we dress kind of for those crowds, the early part of this race, the first few miles to prepare us for the latter part of the course? And then Lindsay, maybe talk about how runners can discard clothing at the start of the race, if we know any information right now. Yeah, so if there are, uh, and Lindsay, you might be able to answer this better than I can, but um, depending on what race you go to, sometimes people will discard items at the very start of the race because they just want to be warm at the very start and race people will come around and collect those clothes and usually donate them to some kind of organization. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to happen at, you know, the half, but, um, something my friends and I used to do before the Turkey trot up in Buffalo it was always very cold, you know, winter in Buffalo. Um, we would go to Ambets and we would buy, you know, oversized cotton, you know, sweats and crew neck sweaters, and we would wear them over our gear and we would, you know, put that on at the car. And we would just walk to the starting line, kind of stay warm in it, strip it off two seconds before the gun was going to go off. And then somebody would come by and, you know, they pick it up, they donate it to the local shelter. So that's like one little thing that you can do. Um, technology has gotten a lot better as time has gone on. So if you are looking for something that's very light that you want to wear as just a wind layer over your body, we make a light packable jacket that actually folds itself into a little pouch. And then you can put that around your waist and that even has a pocket in it. So you can carry your goose or your nutrition or what have you. Um, that's something that I have and I really like it, but if you don't want to wear something around your waist, the, the first option maybe might cost you 10 bucks. And if the organization that you're running with has a, uh, a group of people that come by and pick up those materials, then, you know, absolutely. You should just dump those at the starting line and they'll donate those to a shelter. Lindsay, any take on maybe what's going to be happening at the start of the United Airlines NYC half this year, or is that more TBD right now? Um, I think it's a little TBD, but we usually do have um, uh, volunteers that will collect any throwaway clothes, um, and those do get donated. So you don't have to feel like it's a total waste and it's going in the trash if you're going to toss layers. Um, even usually within the first mile or so of the race, um, we'll collect from there as well. Awesome. Good to know. And stay warm out there in those first few miles. Well, Roberto, I want to come to you. We got a really good question from Karina. Said, I injured my knee and now I'm better and training. And now I'm better and training for the race. Is it okay to use kinesiology tape for all my runs to support my knee? Or is it better to do it for certain runs? 
Thank you for that question, uh, Karina and Steve. And uh, yeah, kinesiology tape is something that um, I employ quite often. Um, obviously, Steve is having a laugh because myself and Coach Ben absolutely struggled through that word uh, back at the TCS New Year's Marathon. Um, core strategy, so shout out to uh, those days of yesteryear. But yeah, I actually used it quite a bit in my lead up to the TCS New Year's Marathon last autumn um, and also on race day. So I find that it helps my muscles. It helps support either the muscle or the ligament, depending on how you apply it and, and when you apply it. So I would definitely say you, you can't go wrong with it. Um, it can at times lead to an over-reliance on it, meaning you don't think that you're healing or you're going to be able to run if you don't use it. So I would say use it uh, sparingly. So it, it, lasts, it can last for one to three days, depending on how you put it and where you put it. So, you know, put it on maybe the night before or the morning of your run and then leave it on for the rest of the day and then take it off if you're not running the next day. That way you're allowed the the body is always trying to heal itself naturally. So the more I can do that unsupported in this case, provided it's not a serious injury, which it sounds like you're on your way back from anyway, um, then the better off you're going to be that way. You don't rely on it too much. And then if you don't put it on, you just think, you know, how will I ever survive without it? But I would say, you know, try it for some of your runs and then you gradually want to try it less and less, meaning applying it less or going longer days in between without um, trying it on. And that's how you can really tell like, how much am I healing? How close am I to 100%? And you can also get that feedback from, from your body, from the muscles, because again, our bodies are constantly giving us feedback. It's just unfortunately us runners tend to ignore it more often than not, but you know, we're, we're hard headed that way. Good answer. I like it a lot. Um, let's go to, uh, we have a question about the course time limit, Lindsay. This is a really good question. Once again, un unsure of the unknown, but Nancy asks, I'm an older runner who is worried about time. What time does the course close? So it could be time of day or maybe per mile time or, or how many hours it's open for. Do you have any, any idea on that yet? Yeah, so we generally ask that runners maintain a 1345 minute per mile pace um, just so that we can reopen the roads at some point and we don't keep them closed forever. Um, so it's mostly to do with our permits. Um, but that does not start getting timed until the last runner crosses the start line. Um, so if you're crossing the start line anytime before the very last runner, you will be getting a little bit more than that. Um, and also, so there will be a sweep bus that follows along the course um, at that pace. So at any point, if you decide that you don't want to keep running, you do have the option to board the sweep bus. Um, but also, you know, we try to keep the finish line open as long as we can, um, since the finish line is within Central Park. So you are welcome to keep running, um, even if you are behind that pace. Uh, you just need to keep in mind that the streets um, will be reopening, so you may have to move on to the sidewalk. Um, but, you know, we're not here to force anybody to stop running. We want to see as many runners finish as possible. Okay. Yeah, I love it. I like that a lot. We want to get everyone who can across that finish line. Roberto, let's go to Remy. He has a good question. We have three minutes left of this chat, so let's try to do these speed rounds so we get to everyone's answer question here. Remy says, should we be expected to finish, I'm sorry, we expect to be a few minutes faster than on the older course. It seems a bit easier, except maybe the 50-foot climb after 10 miles into the course. Yeah, good question. I'll just say really quickly, it depends if you're comparing Remy from, you know, the old course and, and there's actually two old courses. So the old, old course that ran down the essentially the West Side Highway that was lightning fast. Uh, then there's an old course from the first time we switched away from that. And there's a new course that we're ran, we ran last in 2019 and looking to potentially run again this year. So I would say um, if you're going from the original course, that one is really quickly a lot more downhill. So probably not going to run quicker than that assuming all things are equal as far as fitness, Remy 2016 you know, versus Remy um, 2022. Um, if the course, if you're talking about the last two versions of the course, I would say, yeah, they are pretty comparable, um, especially because this course, the current course does not include as much of Central Park as it did the first version that we, we unrolled. So I would just say they're pretty comparable, but you should be a little bit quicker provided you pace yourself well. Great, great answer there, Roberta. I want to go to uh, Lindsay. We have kind of three, two or three questions here about race logistics. Um, not two, but Jackie and Jill are kind of asking similar questions. Uh, any gel stations and biofreeze on the course? And will hydration belts and vests be allowed? And what nutrition will be on the course? So kind of talk about what we know about course amenities at this point. Yeah. 
again, a lot of it's still up in the air. Um, definitely water on the course. Um, that won't change. Um, we do allow fuel belts if you would like to um, carry your own hydration or nutrition. Um, belts are fine. Handheld bottles are fine. Anything that's worn over the shoulders um, is not permitted on the course. So vests, camelbacks, anything like that. Um, so it does need to be either around your waist or in your hand. Um, we generally will also offer Gatorade on the course um, at some of our aid stations along with um, a honey stinger stop for gels. Um, again, not 100% sure um, if that'll be happening or where those will be just based on um, how things are going, who we can get from our partners to be there. Um, same with BioFreeze. Generally, we do have that, but still a little bit up in the air for this year. So sorry that I don't have more specifics. Um, but again, just keep an eye out. All of that will also be on the course map when it's posted. Um, so it will denote where different um, hydration and nutrition stations will be within the course. Lindsay, thank you for that. It's kind of good to know that it, more information will come out, guys. Um, one last question for today's chat, because we have run out of time. Um, Lindsay, this is coming to you from Aaron, a kind of a popular question. Is there an app for the United Airlines NYC half? And is, if, is it out yet? When can we download it? What's the information on the app if there is any information yet? Again, not too much confirmed yet. Um, we will likely either have an app or we'll definitely have live tracking um, through our website. We have that for all of our races. Um, so your friends and family, regardless of how it happens, they will be able to track you along the course. Um, we usually have a mat every 5K. Um, so they'll be able to see when you start and then see when you're crossing those 5K marks. Um, and then also when you cross the finish, just so that if they're you know at home, they can keep up with your progress and congratulate you. Um, but also if they are at the race in person and they're trying to watch you on the course, they kind of have a sense of where you'll be when. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on the website for more information on that um, and exactly how that's going to work. Um, and that's another thing also, if you have specific questions about your race, um, you can ask us at the experience as well. It's awesome to know. Um, so that is our chat, guys. Alex, any final notes or, or feedback for these runners who are training? I think, oh, can, can you hear me? There you go. There you go. There we go. Uh, for all of you that are training and have signed up, you know, the uh, the New York City half is an experience and training for the half is an experience in and of itself. So enjoy every step of the way. Make sure you go and get the right fit for the shoes, um, wear the right layers, and just really enjoy training because it's, it's an experience. You know, once you tow that line and then run the whole experience and then come across that finish line, you feel like, a trillion dollars. It's wonderful. So good luck with it. Love that. Coach Roberto, any final words to our runners out there? Oh, wait. Hang on, Roberto. Hold up. Is that or not? You're in a our back end. Yeah. See if we can get your mic working one last time here. We are, uh, microphones are not working. It might be on mute. Um, Roberto would like to say thank you to all of the runners. He wanted to give a shout out, I know, to Allie from West Africa. So uh, for Roberto, for Allie, quick shout out. Thank you guys so much um, for joining our 2022 United Airlines NYC Half Chat. We're going to another one in a few more weeks to get you even more excited as we get closer to the race. But thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.